Yes, remembering. Remembering is something quite important to those who want to please God. But without remembering, there's no faith and there's no gratitude. How can we be faithful if we forget the important experiences the Lord guided us through? How can we have gratitude for the gift of our Lord, giving his life a ransom for all and the precious promises that by these you will be partakers of the divine nature if we forget that he cleansed us from all our sins? Clearly remembering is important and forgetting is a weakness of ours, but we can remember things important to us. If we stay connected to our Lord, as branches are connected to the vine, surely we will recall what's important. We spoke of distractions. In this modern world, there are so many distractions and they abound. But what we want as footstep followers of Jesus is to have God and his purpose for us as the most important thing in our life. We want to be so absorbed with these things that we will not be distracted by anything. What can be more important than our very salvation? We want to develop the characteristics that our Lord exemplified. To accomplish this, we must remember. And to remember is to remember the words of God and to do to perform those words. Jesus told us that everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock, Matthew 7, 24. So listening to the words of our master is to remember and obeying what he said leads us to our goal. God led the children of Israel by the hand from Egypt. And before they even passed through the Red Sea, they were given the command by God to remember this day and to teach it to their children generationally. God impressed its importance on their minds by fixing a specific date to prepare for the memorial of this event in future years. By doing this, God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham that he would make a nation from his offspring. Your fathers went down to Egypt 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as, a, as numerous as the stars of heaven, Deuteronomy 10, 22. This new nation carried Jehovah's oracles, his plan in types and shadows until the promised seed should come. The messianic seed of promise that God promised would come from their own brethren. Yet we see that the nation of Israel forgot, despite the aids to remember. God had set up feast days, holy convocations, a sacrificial system that was not only yearly, but daily. Twice a day, they had morning and evening sacrifices each day. All these ordinances were to educate and preserve them and to point to that seed of blessing when it arrived. But when the seed did arrive, the nation no longer recognized the testimonies of Moses and the prophets, which pointed to the promised Messianic seed of blessing. Instead, they were steeped in the traditions of men who interpreted God's testimony. They had developed an oral tradition which supplanted the scriptures. This oral tradition was called the oral law by the time of Jesus' first presence. It brought about the Pharisaical system and the rabbinic tradition that exists even today in contemporary Judaism. The oral, the oral tradition blinds even today's Jews to Moses and the law and the prophets, which clearly point to Jesus as their Messiah. Although the Torah clearly states the lineage of the Messiah in 2 Samuel 7, and First Chronicles 17, the birthplace of Messiah in Micah 5, the time of Messiah's coming in Daniel 9, the nature of his birth in Isaiah 7, 
where he will live in Zechariah 9 and what he will do in Isaiah 35 and even their own national response to the Messiah in Isaiah 53 of rejecting him and putting him to death. The destruction of the temple less than 40 years after Jesus declared its destruction was a monumental sign. Yet this oral tradition found in the Talmud, Midrash, and delivered by their sages ignored plain scriptures and supplanted it with their own ideas and creeds. They were distracted from the word of God, then blinded by the interpretations and creeds of their sages. Incidentally, if you ask an Orthodox Jew today, if their sages are sent from God, they'll say, absolutely. The prophets and the words of Moses pointed to the fact that their Messiah had come. He was right before their eyes, but they didn't have an ear to hear the Son of Man, the promised Holy One of Israel. Instead, they urged their oppressors, their overlords, to kill him. All the signs that he performed were attributed to the evil one. This happened because the sages had reinterpreted the Abrahamic seed of blessing to represent Israel instead of the seed that comes through Israel. They thought because they were Abraham's children, they were the promised seed of blessing. John the Baptist corrected their error when he said, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham, Matthew 3, 9. The suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53 became the suffering nation of Israel. And they refused to look at the verses where Isaiah says that his people, the nation of Israel, rejects Messiah. The Torah clearly points to Jesus, but they were blinded by the traditions of men. Jesus told them, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote of me. This is why Jesus told the common Jews in Matthew 23 to listen and do all the Pharisees and their religious leaders say, because they sat in the seat of Moses. The seat of Moses was the place in the synagogue where only the scriptures were read. They didn't have any Pharisaical or Sadducean interpretations. It was just scripture. The people were illiterate and depended on their leaders to read it to them. So Jesus said, yes, listen to them. Listen to them read the scriptures. Why? Because Jesus knew the scriptures spoke of him. Incidentally, well before the birth of Jesus, these sages came up with the four miracles of the Messiah. This was their list of the four signs that the Messiah would perform to verify that he indeed was the Messiah. These were the signs. Healing a leper, healing a man born blind, casting out a demon, and raising a man who has been considered dead for at least four days. I know this list is familiar to us all, and it almost sounds like these sages who wrote this were prophets themselves. And Jesus seems to have accommodated their desire, the desire the Pharisees had, uh, by specifically performing these signs in a deliberate way. Because Jesus purposely delayed getting to Lazarus's tomb. Mary said that he's been dead for four days. After the four days, Jesus resurrects Lazarus to everyone's amazement. But what was the reaction of the Pharisees and scribes? The ones who upheld this traditional view that the sign of resurrecting a person that was dead for four or more days revealed him to be the Messiah. 
This is what John says. He says they called a high council. So this was a big deal. And the result of this high council was one, Jesus used the power of the devil. Two, anyone following him would be excommunicated, which was like being exiled and shunned by your own community and family. And three, that Jesus had to die for the good of the nation. This was the same result with the casting out of the mute demon, that Jesus acted through the power of Beelzebub. And the miracle of the man born blind had the Pharisees launch an investigation where they interrogated the parents because as John says in John 9, 18, they still did not believe that the man was born blind. But the parents didn't want to testify. They were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. So the parents told the Pharisees to ask their son since he was an adult. After all this investigation that the Pharisees had to, to determine whether the man was born blind, the issue that the Pharisees struggled with wasn't that a miracle took place, but that it took place on the Sabbath. And how could the Messiah break the Sabbath? Their traditions dispirited the true intent of the Sabbath and blinded them to a sign of Messiah they themselves upheld. Now, with regard to the healing of the leper as a sign, as a sign that they upheld, this is more than interesting. It was because the priests knew that this ordinance of the Mosaic law had never been performed in its 1500 year history. The only known lepers on record who were cleansed were Miriam, that was Moses' sister, who was healed before this law was enacted, and Nahum the Syrian, who wasn't an Israelite and therefore wasn't under the law. So this priest who the leper would meet would know for a fact that this leper was cleansed by none other than the promised Messiah. It was an absolute sign for them. This is why Jesus said to the leper, go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift commanded for a proof to them. Matthew 8, 4. By the way, if you get a chance, you need to read this ordinance. It's in Leviticus 14. It's 32 verses long. It is the most involved cleansing procedure I have ever seen. It really reveals just how blind they were and even perhaps might reveal a sense of humor on our Lord's part. If the Jews had paid attention to the scriptures instead of the oral law, they would have known the law was also temporary. Why would they need the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 if the law was eternal, was perpetual? They were distracted by traditions of men from the scriptures were taught that the law was temporary, that it served as a tutor, as a shadow, and even as a prosecutor. The scriptures taught that Messiah was to bring a new arrangement where God's law would be written in their hearts, not on stone tablets. This Messiah would off offer the once for all time sin offering, which would ratify this new arrangement and eliminate the typical sacrificial system. And that God's spirit was to reside in them, not in a building. But blinded by their traditions and blind shepherds, they missed it. They missed it all. Paul rightly said it. Blindness has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. This is fulfilled prophecy before our eyes. The nation of Israel is totally blind to the fact that Jesus Christ Yeshua Ha Mashiach is their promised and long awaited Messiah. Jesus rightly said of them, You make void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. Mark 7:13. Indeed, not only were the Jews of Jesus' first advent blind to the fact that they were unable to keep the law, 
But present day Judaism is also totally blind to that fact that they can't keep it either. Not because it's impossible to keep the tenets of the law, but because it's impossible to keep because there's no temple, there's no priesthood. And since the temple's destruction, there's no law covenant arrangement at all. The law covenant was a blood covenant. It required daily and yearly sacrifices to renew the covenant for the coming year. It required a priesthood as well. Even if they were to build another temple today or sometime in the future, who would be their priests? All the gene genealogical records were destroyed in 70 AD. There's no way of knowing who the Levites are. Additionally, Jesus told them that God's spirit would vacate the temple. Its destruction testified to that. God's spirit no longer occupies the temple made with hands. It resides in Jesus' footstep followers. For ye are the temple of God, for his spirit dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16. The Jewish nation failed then and fails today to see that Jesus the Messiah nailed the law to the cross. The nation of Israel was favored by God, not because of being better than any other nation, but because of the promise made to Abraham, Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. The promised messianic seed of blessing was not to come from any nation in the world, but through the Jewish nation, which was fulfilled with Christ. And the Jewish nation was the first to be called to become co-inheritors with that messianic seed, which came from their own descendants. However, as a nation, they, re they were rejected because of unbelief. But many, a remnant, did obey the call and our brethren. The book of Acts speaks of 3,000 Jews being baptized in one day, with an additional 5,000 on another day. Moreover, the door still stands open today to both Jew and Gentile to become associated with Jesus and share as co-inheritors as that messianic seed of blessing. And we too, brethren, are favored by God. And like the nation of Israel, not because we're any better than anyone else, there isn't anything special about us. Paul says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. And none is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks for God. No one does good. No, not one. In fact, a careful reading of these texts reveal that our desire to do good, our desire to seek God, is from God. That he himself cultivated this in us before we answered the call. This is his unmerited kindness, his favor toward us. This is how Philippians 2.13 states it. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here's the international standard version. For it is God who is producing in you both the desire and the ability to do what pleases him. God's grace for us began when he chose us. This is what our Lord told the disciples. You did not choose me. I chose you. And if you think he meant that specifically to the disciples, this is what Jesus said to all those who will be called, which is us, brethren. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. John 6, 44. Jesus is quoting Isaiah 54, 13. So according to Jesus, it was God who chose us to be associated with him. It was his idea. His will, his determination, not ours. In fact, Jesus is saying in this scripture text that before we even answered our call, we were taught by God. 
Here we see God choosing us ahead of the call and preparing us to respond to the call by finding salvation in Jesus. Jesus also said that all that the Father sends me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So Jesus promises to never reject anyone selected and sent to him by God. But God's grace didn't stop there for us. Our great God of the universe looked our way and chose us for his purpose. He has a mission for us, brethren. He took us out of darkness and put us in his marvelous light and associated us with his whole only begotten son. Brethren, how can we fully wrap our hearts and minds around this? This must be deeply contemplated. To appreciate this is to deepen our gratitude to our Father. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that God chose and called us to partake of the divine nature. And in verse 10, he states that he wants us to make certain of our calling and election. The word election means to choose, to select. So God chose us for this call to the divine nature. Peter emphasizes to the divine nature by calling it an exceeding and very precious promise. After this, he exhorts those chosen to this call to add to this faith. To what faith? To the faith of being chosen and called. Add virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Surely an incomplete list, but it makes the point. Now, is Peter suggesting that we add these character traits to earn the divine nature? I mean, is that even possible? Or is he suggesting that we can work our way to deserving this promise of the divine nature? It's really neither. Paul, Peter exhorts us to add these things in earnest from gratitude. And so our spiritual vision would grow and we would discern God's will for us and prevent us from becoming spiritually blind. Clearly, no one can earn the divine nature, for it is by grace. It is the gift of God, not, not the result of works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Incidentally, the desire for these righteous qualities reveals the spirit of truth and those with the spirit of truth thirst for righteousness <clears throat> there are other scriptures which confirm this thought that it was god's choice in whom he should favor it isn't even the choice of the ones chosen for instance did the levites choose to be Levites, or were they chosen by God to be? The scripture says, no man takes dishonor unto himself, they are called of God. The picture of marriage, the picture of the bride, is always the father choosing the bride for his son. This is the picture of God making the choice of who will be the bride for his son. Did the nation of Israel choose to be the favored nation in all the world? Out of all nations, only you have I known? Did Abraham choose to be the father of the seed of blessing? Or did God visit him with the promise that he would be? Even Jesus Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by God. Hebrews 5.5. 5. So do we take this honor unto ourselves of being called to the divine plane of existence? Is it our decision? to be a co-inheritor with Christ, or is it by appointment, an appointment by God? God invites who he selects. Paul describes God's exclusive prerogative to whom he chooses in Romans 9, 16, when he says, so it does not depend on human will or human exertion, but on God who has mercy. So could we glory in our decision to consecrate? Yes, 
there's something to glory in with our choosing of God. But which is more glorious? Which is more important? Which really makes the difference in the end? That we chose God or that God chose us? What we could glory in is our response to God's election of us. We obeyed our father when he called us. So brethren, we, we must be faithful to his selection and call of us and to be thankful in his choosing us for the call and for cultivating us to desire to do his will. Or as we said before, for it is God who is producing in you both the desire and the ability to do what pleases him. Philippians 2.13. There are those who struggle with this idea that God is the one that is producing in us a desire to do his will. They think, some, they think somehow we lost our free will by him doing so. Yet don't parents do this all the time? Parents will overrule the wills of their children and try to cultivate in them what they believe is good, hoping that the children will one day appreciate it and desire it for themselves. How many accomplished people have credited their parents and were grateful that their parents overruled what they wanted to do, what they willed to do, and instead disciplined them and cultivated them? Something that they perhaps had absolutely no interest or there was no importance to them at a former time. And these are imperfect parents with loving intentions that are overruling their children's wills and trying to have them will something they believe is better. How many of these well-intentioned parents fail in cultivating their children by overruling their wills? There are many. A good home with good parents and upbringing has more success than a broken home, but it's no guarantee. Sometimes good parents have bad children. But our Heavenly Father is not an imperfect parent. When he decides to work in us, there's success. If we trust and obey him, all things will work for good for those who love God, to the called according to his purpose. If we do his commandments, we love him. Jesus, pardon me. Jesus said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And I'll reveal myself to him, John 14, 21. He promised that he will keep us from falling if we trust him, Jude 24. He promised that he will complete the work that he started in us, Philippians 1, 6. We need only to trust and obey him. Brother, we're talking about remembering, remembering the promises of God for us. We must embrace them. Another thing we want to remember, which will reveal humility, is that we don't and we will never know everything scripturally on this side of the veil. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 13, 9. But what we know is incomplete, and what we prophesy is incomplete. Paul says we have partial knowledge, and our prophetic understanding remains partial and incomplete until its fulfillment. Even the apostles knew not the day or the hour and wrote in the early epistles as if everything would be wrapped up in their lifetime. Paul's later letters, however, like 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, reveal that as his end was nearing, he realized that the church would continue and he organized the ecclesia with class election of elders and deacons instead of apostolic choice in the laying on of their hands. In fact, in the context of telling us how we have incomplete knowledge and incomplete prophetic understanding, he tells us what is most important for us is to build love within the context of our shared experience of being graciously gifted with the truth. To think we know it all and have complete knowledge is to blind ourselves to any further learning. The scriptures place the development of love as primary, yes, even above what we conceive to be accurate interpretation of doctrine or prophecy. 
This love has its foundation rooted in God's call to be the bride of Christ and in the faith in Jesus' ransom sacrifice for all. It is a love based on what Christ has done for us. It is to be fervent, not dispassionate. It is rooted in our shared experience of being called out of darkness and being brought into God's marvelous light. It really is a joint effort for we all bring in perspectives that complete a picture. There has and always will be differences in interpretations of scriptures. We need only disagree respectfully and remember that we could be wrong. Admitting that we can be wrong is not a lack of faith in the knowledge of the truth. It's a humble admission that we can be wrong. We're fallen. No two people will agree on everything. And may we never divide over an idea or an interpretation of doctrine or prophecy. Paul never censured or disqualified any of the brethren for an interpretation. The Corinthians questioned the first resurrection. Paul explained how foolish that was, but he never told them they couldn't serve or fellowship. He lovingly corrected the Thessalonians who believed that the presence was past. This is what he said to them. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. What a statement. And these are brethren who got the presence wrong. So we must love one another as Christ loved us. It's easy. It's easy to love brethren we know that are connected to us by family ties. And we just get along so well with. Even Jesus spent more time with Peter, John, and James over the others. So it's natural that we would love those who love us back. Yet our development would be incomplete if we only love those who love us back. Jesus wants us to love all our brethren fervently. Let's be inclusive and try to see things from the other brother or sister's point of view. Let's listen to understand more than to listen to agree or disagree. Let's make loving connections with all our brethren despite our differences in opinions or interpretations. Let's remember God chooses who our brethren are, not us. So I'm not telling you anything yet haven't known already. I'm just bringing it up so that we can remember. So what else should we remember? That we're purified by fire. It is human suffering which God uses to accomplish the transformation in us. Human suffering is difficult to comprehend. Explaining the permission of evil is a lot easier. Why must I suffer? Jesus suffered. And we're told that his transformation wouldn't be complete without suffering. I heard a... Um, a little story I want to tell you. I hope I tell it as good as I heard it. Uh, and it has to do with a jeweler and his son. And I think it, it really impressed uh, me. I want to share that. So, so there was a jeweler who uh, bought uh, old jewelry and he would melt down this jewelry to collect the pure gold from it after purifying it. And he would fashion new jewelry from it and then sell it. His son was with him. And he was teaching his son how to purify gold, to make gold from the jewelry. So he collected the old rings and bracelets and earrings, and he placed them in a crucible, uh, which looked like a soup bowl. Uh, and then he proceeded to show his son that you must apply very intense flame with a torch to all the jewelry. The son was amazed as he saw the old jewelry which had ornaments and various colors on them, start to melt and sink into an all yellow colored liquid bowl. All the ornaments and the dross just evaporated in a vaporous cloud. So the son was really intrigued by this and asked his father, is that pure gold? His father said, no, not yet. There's still impurities inside. And the only way to get 
it out is to apply more intense flame. So the father applied the more intense flame and he leaned over just above the liquid gold, looking intently into it. And the yellow gold started to get brighter and shinier. And then the son asks, when will you know that it's pure? And the father replied, I know the purifying is complete when I see the reflection of my face in the gold. Our father loves us. He takes no pleasure in our suffering, but in his wisdom, he knows that it is through human suffering that he can transform us to reflect his glorious image. He needs us to trust him. This is what our Lord went through. So when we're really hurting, brethren, we can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's been there. He knows. God, our Father, is doing a magnificent work in us, something we could never do ourselves. Do we really know how to transform ourselves into the divine nature, brethren? But we do know that we want to be faithful by not quenching the spirit, by conforming our wills to the Father's will, and by fighting the good fight of faith, by putting on Christ, by putting on the whole armor of God. So what is the sum of what we're saying today about remembering? That God the Father has chosen and called us to be associated with the promised messianic seed of blessing that will eventually bless the whole world of mankind. We cannot earn this precious promise, but we can lose it if we forget what is required of us. The nation of Israel was promised that the seed of blessing would come through them. And when it did, the good news was to become associated with that seed. But they rejected their Messiah and the good news because they made God's word void to the traditions of men. The nation of Israel serves as an example to us to trust only God's word and to not take for granted his undeserved favor toward us. We, like the noble Bereans, should search the scripture to see if it is so. No book or person is above the Bible or our Lord. Our Lord is our master. He has the last word on all things. Because in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. Hebrews 1-2. Jesus is the word of God. Let us remember this. Lest a promise being left to us, any of us should come short of it. We must labor, therefore, lest any man should fall after the same example of unbelief.